Sporting Journal Radio, presented by Onyx. All right, well, we got some numbers from the Minnesota DNR regarding waterfowl and the breeding numbers. And there's a couple of things to take away from this uh, because the numbers overall, they're saying, are down this year. The percentages are down this year, but they're comparing it to 2019. So what are the waterfowl numbers like out there? North Dakota put out some numbers this year that were very promising. Let's break it all down with John Devney from Delta Waterfowl right now here on the show. John, how you doing? Good. Good to be on with you again. It's getting to be that time of year. Best time of year. It's almost here. I'm excited. <laughs> and it sounds like you got a lot to be excited for over in North Dakota. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's pretty amazing. North Dakota Game and Fish sort of made mention of this when they released their survey results, Brett, is, you know, we went from being pretty wet. Um, you know, remember that big blizzard we had put us in really good shape at least early in 2020 for the 2020 breeding season, um, you know, had good water conditions. Of course, we didn't fly a survey in 2020 because of COVID, but North Dakota Game and Fish continued uh, their long running survey. So we knew we were wet in 2020, uh, but shortly after the survey happened, we got really dry here. We got really dry lots of places. And then we know that uh, last year was incredibly dry. And then, you know, on the strength of better than average precipitation over the winter, maybe more normal precipitation over the course of the winter. And then, you know, some timely spring rains. And then, of course, that August blizzard really set wetland conditions up. And and I think North Dakota Game and Fish said that there was a 616% increase in year-over-year wetland conditions. I, wow. so I wish my stock market for poor, poor Folio performance was up 650. <laughs> did you say August blizzard, by the way? I know it gets uh, April, cold. April, did April. I say August blizzard? I didn't mean <laughs> August blizzard. Although, listen, I live in North Dakota. Maybe it's happened. You uh, should never April, know. April blizzard. That's funny. Well, uh, so we, in, in here in Minnesota, uh, we didn't. We don't have any numbers from last year to compare it to, but we've been so dry over here, at least in the southern half of the state. But this spring, our water was way up. Like we, the river was flooding. Uh, a lot of seasonal wetlands were 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 real full. So we were worried that actually some nests were getting washed out. So I think we lost some some nesting early, and then everything really dried up. So I I don't know what to what to expect here this fall. Well. I will tell you that, yeah, we lose some nests to get flooded. I mean, it certainly happens with canvasbacks and redheads, although I think when you look at it on the whole, you'd be amazed to know that you might be startled to know that there is never too much water on the prairies. I mean, there's too much water for communities. There's too much water for farmers. But when it comes to breeding ducks, you can't have too much. And every drop of water that, you know, that we can get, is a good thing for breeding dogs. Yeah. Well, and I, I actually got to see, uh, I had a blue winged teal nest in the yard this year. And she actually, I don't know if you'd be able to find that video. It's probably too short a notice for Dan to find that video, but she actually, uh, I had some tall grass not far from the house that she built this nest in. And I put a camera next to it and actually got some video of this blue winged teal sitting on her nest for uh, for a little while, and then I and then I I let her rest for a couple of days. I figured I, I had a camera there, so I backed out for a couple of days and just kind of let her be. And when I came back, uh, something had eaten all the eggs and destroyed yeah. the nest. So it was a little it was a little disappointing, but it was uh, I'm sure she re-nested somewhere else and uh, hopefully had maybe a smaller clutch, but hopefully had some more little blue winged well, teal babies. And that's- that's really what happened. So, you know, we've talked about it in the past, Brett, you know, when I said there's no such thing as too much water on the prairies. So we get water in the spring, we get it early enough, ducks distribute into the best landscapes where we really want them to be in the prairies, right? But the second thing, the real benefit we get is that heavy re-nesting effort when females have access to those temporary and seasonal wetlands throughout the breeding period and can re-nest. Um, I bet you there was almost no re-nesting last year. In fact, there are probably females that sat it out entirely last year. So, you know, when you live in the situation that we live in today, where we've got a lot of landscapes with pretty low nest success, these years where we're crazy wet, have incredible re-nesting, are 
turn out to be the boom years. And then the third benefit we get is what we know about duckling survival is duckling survival is highly correlated with wet seasonal wetlands. Because those ducklings, when you got seasonal wetlands that are full of, full of water, they have incredible amounts of escape cover and they survive and fledge. So that's why we want it wet on the prairies. Get them in the right places, heavy renesting effort to overwhelm high predation rates and then high duckling survival. Well, looking at some of these numbers in Minnesota, the breeding population es- estimate for mallards was 231,000. That's right around the long-term average, which is good. It is uh, 19% below the 2019 estimate, but uh, blue-winged teal is, is down a bit. And then the rest of the ducks are just down uh, about 6%. And then in North Dakota, though, there's some numbers I want to get to because mallards were up 58% from last year, the 25th highest count on record, which is good. But... John, you got to be excited. The ruddy duck index increased 157%. John. Yeah. I mean, Lord <laughs> knows um, I'm going to be painting a lot of bright blue beaks on decoys. <laughs> with, with little brown ruddy ducks. Dollar ducks. Uh, that's great. But uh, sho- shovelers and pintails, 108% increase in pintails over there. That's got to get people excited. Well, I mean, again, I think – what's going to be really interesting is to look at the full distribution of the birds, right? Because, you know, the, the challenge we've had the last couple of years is we, you know, we've had thanks to the good work of the North Dakota game and fish and their staff, they've been diligent about collecting data, but they've been the only one. So we're looking at all this population data sort of in isolation. And I, you know, I would expect that, you know, think about it. We went from really dry to really wet in a real hurry I'm sure this was an attractive place for pintails because we had lots of temporary and seasonal wetlands, the very habitat they like. Pintail populations in the U.S. prairies and the eastern Dakotas have done really pretty well over the last 15 years. So we're building more and more of a tradition with pintail breeding in North Dakota over time. And this year we had the table set in terms of abundant temporary and seasonal wetlands being brimful of water. I'm excited. I've, I've really in the last week or so, I don't know if it's because game fair is taking place or what, or game, you know, re- recently took place, but I, I don't know if that's kind of my official benchmark for when, when I get excited about fall or what, but I'm, I've been seeing some combines. There's been a couple of fields. Yeah. There's a silage field that was out early and uh, an oats field that came out early. And I've been seeing doves all over the place. There's a little bit of crispness in the air. In the, there have yeah, been a couple of those mornings that made you feel like, okay, now we're getting closer, right? Yeah. I'm so excited. And, we're, of course, uh, Dan and I are heading up to Saskatchewan. We're going to be spending some time up there, John. And uh, what do you think – what what impact do you think this um, avian influenza, there's a ban on bringing birds back from Saskatchewan? What kind of impact do you think that might have uh, Actually, from Canada? I as of say. right now – yeah, as of right now, there shouldn't be a ban, Brett because um, Canada has been tracking these sort of priority control zones pretty, pretty closely. Um, and the, the original guidance that we received in early July was that they would prohibit the import of birds from those high control zones. Right now, there's not a single one in Saskatchewan. Oh, okay, there's not good. A single one in Manitoba, and there's not a, and there's one in Alberta. So the, now, interestingly enough, Ontario and Quebec seem to be where there's the most problems right now. Hmm. Um, so we're hoping to get clarity. In the, the challenge is you've got all these agencies that have overlapping responsibilities, right? So you've got USDA APHIS, who is responsible for the importation of stuff from outside the country. They've issued this guidance, in the, in, but the guidance links to what the Canadian government is specifying is these priority control zones. But then you have customs and border agents having to interpret all that. And so (laughs) hopefully what we will see in the coming weeks before guys start going up September 1st is to get some clarity. I think we've got clarity based on the USDA guidance, but how is that interpreted by an individual custom and border agent? Wait a minute. As of right now, Saskatchewan and Manitoba look pretty good. So you wait a minute. You're telling me that government is confusing 
Uh, about Four something confusing yes <laughs> well that's I'm, occasionally confusing i'm glad i'm not the only one because we were trying to look that up the other day and we couldn't figure it out and we were right. looking at these priority zones and the map we looked at there was spots in alberta there were spots in saskatchewan so i was like is that is that a priority zone are we do are we banned from bringing birds back i couldn't figure it out and i didn't spend a lot of time on it of course but uh it was it was definitely a, a confusing trip onto the internet for me. Yep. No. Hopefully, there's going to be some more clarity. And it's been interesting because we issued a news story with the guidance from USDA. Our our team did a really nice job compiling it and provided the link to the Canadian priority control zones. And it's in the, in the I'll give the Canadian government credit there. That's a very adaptive process. Yeah. There are places sure. coming on, there are places going out. And I think when I first looked at it in early July, I think there were a half dozen or so sites in Saskatchewan and maybe understating or overstating it a little bit and a couple in Manitoba. And as of this morning, when I looked, there were no sites in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Okay. Yeah. It looks like, uh, 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 scroll down just a little. Ontario, Quebec, and one in Alberta. Okay, that's what you were saying. One in Alberta, right there. Okay, yep. interesting. Yeah, well, that's good. That's good news. I know uh, maybe an influenza is uh, something that needs to be on all of our uh, everybody's radar, of course. And it's nothing you ever want to hear about. But uh, it seems like it's it's around every year. It just seems to be a little bit more prevalent right now. What do you think is what 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 do you think is causing it to just spike it seems like it's there's a little bit more of it going on right now what do you think's causing that well i think we had a pretty unique situation this spring right and you think about you think about the species that were hardest hit by it, it was snow geese right yeah. and well look what happened this spring we had a late spring and in a late spring what do snow geese do well they migrate back especially the adults because they want to get back to the their breeding colonies early um, cause that's, we know that when they nest early, they have the highest reproductive potential. And so they're in a hurry to get back and we slowed them down, uh, this year in a big way, which means you've got a lot of geese highly congregated in places like uh, around ice holes and frozen lakes. And, you know, you set up a great sort of incubator for the, that disease spreading. Now, the interesting thing that I saw is I was up and, you know, I saw clear evidence of it in North Dakota in March, um, just driving around and seeing snow geese, either dead snow geese oh, yeah. or five, six snow geese in places where you shouldn't see them. Um, there were people the watching was, them. Sorry, there were people watching them drop right out of the air. Yeah. And, but by the time I was in Manitoba in early May doing a little snow goose hunting, I didn't see a single one. Hmm. Good. So in in the Canadian Wildlife Service did some pretty good uh, harvest sampling of those birds to see what was happening sort of in the free flying population. So, I mean, I think this was sort of the perfect storm, right? You jam all those birds in a few little places, probably sets up, you know, probably like having COVID on a small airplane, right? Yeah. You, know, <laughs> yeah. you get a lot of people sick and a lot of, in a real hurry. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, that that's good news. So do you think, um, did we not have a great snow goose hatch then this year because of that, you think? I, I don't spring? know. I, I mean, I don't think, I don't think the direct mortality is going to be huge in most places. I'm here in places where there were some problems, uh, but, you know, when we get the report, full report from the feds, uh, you know, we'll have a better glimpse of that. I heard some pretty encouraging news about really good production out of some of those colonies. So, mm. um, but you know, it's all anecdotes till we see the big report from the feds here in the next little bit. If we talked about that colony that's been established over in Alaska, the, the new colony that we had, uh, did you see that interview we did with the guy on our show about that? I, I haven't. It's, it's, it was pretty interesting. We'll send it to you. But uh, a few months back or this spring, I suppose, we had a biologist, biologist on and, and he, they, it was uh, because somebody shot us, what, somebody shot a goose with a tarsal band, Dan? Yeah, we shot a tarsal in North Dakota in April or whatever. And so we, uh, how'd that go? We 
kind of got the data. It was from Alaska. And so we reached out and, and got a hold of the biologist who banded it. And it was because it was a young bird. It was a, a juvie. Yeah. And so that's kind of raised some, some eyebrows why there was already a tarsal then a juvie up there and they were uh, tracking a new colony that basically has been forming Alaska the last few years. So interesting. I shot my first band, you know, I don't know what it is, but I always seem to, you know, shoot a banded snow goose or two in the spring. But uh, on veterans day here, a couple of years ago, I got sort of aced out of the place I wanted to duck hunt and ended up past shooting snow geese. And first I shot an Eagle head that, was banded and i was surprised to see that one came out of alaska too mm. so it's, it's interesting that those birds are pretty um pretty adaptable and see keep finding a way to win yeah and well that's exactly right and that's what we talked to this biologist about because we figured they were birds that were actually moving moving uh west that had been part of colonies further east and had moved west for whatever reason. And they were trying to figure out what that reason is because it's kind of a different food source. It's different. Uh, it's a different landscape. Yet they're they're coming from Alaska and migrating down to the Dakota. So it was uh, it was kind of interesting that and they're and it's growing very fast. Of course, a big surprise sn- snow goose population growing, <laughs> growing, very growing fast. really fast. But um uh, I, I'm excited for this fall and I didn't, I wanted to make it to the duck hunters expo this year. I didn't make it down there. How, did you get down there? How did it go? Yeah, we, it was a great turnout. Our staff did an incredible job. I mean, obviously it was the first one we've ever done. So mm-hmm. I think there was a little bit of trepidation and anxiety, but, um, I think everybody that was involved with it was very pleased. The vendors were very pleased. The attendees were very pleased, and we were certainly very pleased as well. So it was a great success, and it turns out Little Rock was a great place to hold it. Well, when you want to talk uh, waterfowl hunting, Arkansas is an a, is a obvious choice. And putting on an event like that, I can understand there, there being some nervousness about it because that's a pretty big undertaking. It was an incredible undertaking, but our staff did an incredible job, and Lots of hard work from lots of our staff to make sure that thing was a great success. So this can be an annual deal then? Uh, We're waiting to see, but it's being discussed. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Would would, uh, would the plan, do you think, be to have it there again, or would you move it around? uh, I I don't know. I think that's still in the deliberation stage, too. Um, You know, if you look at Pheasants Forever has had great success sort of moving it around a community of cities with coming back to St. Paul, I think every five years. I think that's that's right. right. Yeah. But I think they've sort of honed in on Omaha and Sioux Falls and can't remember all the other places, but I mean, that's worked very nicely for Pheasants Forever. Um, You know, NWTF has done theirs in Nashville for eternity. Uh, SCI has done theirs in Reno for eternity. So, I guess that'll be left as smarter people to know what the heck they're doing <laughs> in nature. Sure. Well, uh, it's always interesting talking ducks. I know some more numbers are, are coming out, and uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about those yet, but I'm sure we will in the future. And, uh, and next time we talk to you, we'll probably be holding – uh, birds in our hand, hopefully in a wheat field in Saskatchewan. So, um, John Devney, Delta Waterfall, as always, appreciate the time today on the show. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a wonderful trip to Saskatchewan. Hear more at SportingJournalRadio.com or wherever you get podcasts. 852 million acres of public land, 147 million private properties, all in the palm of your hand. The number one hunting GPS app just got better. With hundreds of custom map layers, 3D and topographic maps, you can easily scout on the road or at home before you go. And now you can get important weather details, CWD detection, and even know what crops have been planted where. Get the most trusted hunting GPS app ever made. Onyx. Know where you stand with Onyx.